Well, good morning, everyone. And thank you for attending our annual Lincoln Day Talk. Uh, my name's Lee Frazier. I'm a supervising deputy district attorney of the General Felonies Unit at the district attorney's office. And I'm the moderator for today's talk. Our speaker, Dr. Terrence Roberts, a member of the history making Little Rock Nine is very close to my heart for a number of reasons. As many of you may know, I was born in Little Rock, Arkansas. I am a fifth generation Arkansan, and I grew up um, figuratively and almost literally in the shadow of Central High School, which changed in its fall semester in 1957 from an average all white Arkansas high school to an iconic battleground of the civil rights struggle. The very first time that I walked into Central High School was as a young girl to watch a football game with my dad, which is in striking contrast to the first time a teenage Terrence Roberts walked through its doors. As a young girl, I did not fully appreciate the import of walking into a once segregated high school. I did not understand that a teenager and eight other children had risked their lives to make that same simple journey. My parents grew up in Arkansas during the Jim Crow era and they went to segregated schools their entire lives. My siblings and I are the very first generation of our family to have all of our rights fully recognized by the state. And Dr. Roberts is one of the people that we have to thank for that. When I look back on that video from 1957 of Dr. Roberts and the rest of the Little Rock Nine entering Central High School, I am in awe. I am in awe of their composure I'm humbled by their bravery. And I would like to thank Dr. Roberts for so generously sharing his time with us today. Um, so with that, uh, we're going to watch a short video now from Marquette University, and then we'll hear from uh, Jeff Rosen. How about you, sir? Do you think the colored students will show up? If I got anything to do with it, they won't show up. Well, I think it's a breaking point of the school integration. I just don't uh, feel that they have a right to go to school with them. It is easy to believe today that we are an enlightened society, free from problems of race, gender, or economic separation. But some of the most difficult lessons we learn are a result of individuals who push us through these divisive barriers. In September of 1957, nine black school children, the eldest only 17, forced us through such a blockade. They sought a better education for themselves and the opportunity to pursue the American dream. This is Central High School, Little Rock, Arkansas. Troops, which for nearly three weeks lined the sidewalk here in front of the high school under orders to keep the colored students out, have been replaced now from their orders to comply with the law, which means let the Negro students in if they come in. We were Terrence Roberts, Ms. Jefferson Thomas, Thelma Mothershed, Elizabeth Eckford, Ernest Green, Carlotta Walls, Melba Patillo, Minnie Jean Brown, and Gloria Ray. They became known as the Little Rock Nine. The 1954 Supreme Court ruling on Brown versus the Board of Education found segregation of schools unconstitutional. But as the Little Rock Nine approached the high school, segregationists swarmed the campus. I got no business out here. <laughs> this is our school, not theirs. They are, they are their own. As the violence escalated, one schoolgirl, Elizabeth Eckford, was threatened by an angry mob chanting, lynch her, lynch her. President Dwight Eisenhower intervened in Little Rock and set a precedent for our nation as a whole. 
such an extreme situation has been created in Little Rock. This challenge must be met, and with such measures as will preserve to the people as a whole their lawfully protected rights in a climate permitting their free and fair exercise. In the present case, the troops are there pursuant to law solely for the purpose of preventing interference with the orders of the court. On September 25, 1957, the 101st Airborne Division and 10,000 National Guard troops escorted the Little Rock Nine as they walked bravely past screaming mobs and made their way to the classrooms of Little Rock Central High School. Just got a report here on this end that the students are in. Do you feel it's worth it going through this? Yes, I do. These nine heroes were willing to step forward and in doing so, altered the course of history. Marquette University is honored to bestow upon them the Pierre Marquette Discovery Award for this extraordinary contribution to the advancement of education for all people. The Little Rock Nine stand not just for racial equality, but also for the promise upon which our society is founded, opportunity and equality for all willing to strive, struggle, and achieve. Good morning, everyone. There are some people who change the course of history in our country. Our guest speaker, Dr. Terrence Roberts, is one of those people. In 1954, in the landmark case, Brown versus Board of Education, the Supreme Court ruled that racial segregation in public education was unconstitutional. But it would take another three years before that ruling was tested in the South. That testing ground was Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas. Our guest, Dr. Terrence Roberts, was one of nine students who integrated Central High School in 1957. At the young age of 15, he and his fellow students faced down an angry mob to integrate what had previously been a whites only high school. Their entry into Central High School was the culmination of years of work and organizing by civil rights pioneers such as Daisy Bates and Thurgood Marshall. Since that time, Dr. Roberts has gone on to earn a Bachelor of Arts degree from Cal State University at Los Angeles, a master's degree from UCLA, and a PhD in psychology from Southern Illinois University. Dr. Roberts has had a long career in both the fields of psychology and academia. He has worked for more than 30 years as a clinical psychologist. He was the Director of Mental Health Services at St. Helena Hospital and Health Services and an Assistant Dean of Student Services at UCLA and the Department Chair of the Psychology Department at Antioch University. He is also a member of the adjunct faculty at the Simon Wiesenthal Center in Los Angeles. In 1999, he and the other members of the Little Rock Nine were awarded the Congressional Gold Medal, the highest civilian honor our Congress can bestow on an individual, joining the likes of Neil Armstrong, Jonas Salk, Nelson Mandela, and six former U.S. presidents. During the award ceremony, President Clinton described the Little Rock Nine by saying, when they marched up the steps to the school, a simple act, they became foot soldiers for freedom, carrying America to higher ground. It is my pleasure to introduce Little Rock Nine member, Dr. Terrence Roberts. Well, thank you very much indeed, Jeff. And thank you, Leigh, for the invitation to join you on this celebration. I'd like to share with you some thoughts I have, starting with my entry into this universe in December of 1941, and what happens when you find yourself in circumstances about which you have little knowledge or understanding, and over which you have literally no control. 
As a very young person in Little Rock, I was astounded, shocked to find out that we were living under legalized segregation. In 1896, the Plessy Court, Supreme Court, ruled that it was indeed constitutional to have ourselves involved in this kind of social relationship. Interesting, to say the least. Now, it's important to note the words. The Plessy Court said that it was constitutional to discriminate. That gives it a lot of weight. And so my early years were spent under that cloud of oppression that comes along with legalized discrimination. I didn't like it, put it mildly. Nothing about it made sense. I saw it as illegal, immoral, irrational, and any other thing that you can find in that same area of understanding. But I questioned as much as I could to try and find out reasons why. I found out though, that a number of adults, especially black adults in my life were unwilling to engage me in any conversation about it because there were looks of fear etched on their faces when I brought the subject up. You wanna get us all killed? Don't bring that stuff up, boy. Keep your mouth shut. Not the best advice from my point of view, but I recognize my need to accept their point of view and not bring up the subject, but it didn't mean that I would stop looking for answers. So I dived into the archives to find out, you know what? It's all written down. The truth about who we are has been written down by historians. The problem is for us as a group of people in this country is that most of us don't read the historical record for ourselves. We accept the interpretation provided by others who have some sort of bias or slant about how that information should be presented. So I've come to term what we usually get in our school systems as the approved national narrative. Not enough, not enough. Our goal as individuals is to find out for ourselves what the truth is. And so today, in part, as we have our dialogue together, I will be insisting that each one of you as participants in this program pledge to take on that responsibility to learn for yourself what the truth is and begin to make your decisions based on that rather than someone else's interpretation. My journey into all of this was helped by what happened to me in first grade. I went to Gibbs Elementary, a segregated elementary school in Little Rock for the first few years of my formal education, the first grade teacher said to all of us six-year-olds, you kids must take on executive responsibility for learning. I took her up on it. I established the Terry Roberts Learning Academy in September of 1947, and it has been full-blown since. No breaks of service, dues paid on time, no late fees. Why? Because learning is essential. Without that, you have no access to the options available to you. And there are options in the billions around us. Most of us know very few of them. In fact, I might be so bold as to say, the biggest thing any of us possess is a storehouse of ignorance. Our job over the lifetime is to reduce the size of that storehouse before we're dropped into the grave. Keep in mind that you will never learn all there is to be known that's simply too much, but you can make a dent in your own storehouse of ignorance by diligence, by making certain that you're not one of those who are satisfied with just a few options. And so it was that when I was 13 years old, the Supreme Court ruled again, this time the Brown decision in 1954. This decision turned Plessy on its head, a 180 degree shift the Brown court said it is no longer constitutional to discriminate. I felt energized. I wasn't naive enough to know or to think even that that one Supreme Court ruling would change anything, but it did change the law. And having the law changed is a very big deal. Whether or not it's enforced, whether or not in my lifetime, it will show what it can really do. It is so important to have that on the books. And so, and when the time came for me to volunteer to become one of the Little Rock Nine, 
had both hands up. The count was off by at least one. I wanted to be a part of this simply because, as I said before, as a very young person, I didn't think any of this stuff made sense. And now here was an opportunity to find a way to create a real shift, something that would make a difference in the lives of black people who were living under this yoke of oppression. And so here we are today uh, discussing some of these things. And now I'm going to, to pause and I'm going to uh, engage with uh, Jeff in some Q and A, but I want you to pay close attention because you're going to be involved in the second part of that Q and A. Okay, ready, Jeff? I am ready, uh, Dr. Roberts. So I have a number of questions for you. Uh, one word we often hear associated with the Little Rock Nine is courage. Did you understand in the moment what courage it took to desegregate an all white school in the South? Well, uh, I must admit that as a very young person at that time, I didn't think too much about courage. Teenagers especially have this penchant for death defying through life. There's a feeling of immortality that just <laughs> runs through the blood of teenagers, I think. I think back on some of the exploits I was involved in, and I know it's true, probably for all of us as well. So you find yourself facing things, thinking you have the power and the determination and the strength to prevail, when in fact, you are putting yourself in great jeopardy. Well, we were indeed in great jeopardy. However, it didn't take long for me to figure out that I needed something like courage to help me keep on. But that something like courage was more fear that was... Uh, tucked away in my pocket. I was so afraid. I'd never been that afraid in my life. I didn't think people could actually be that afraid. I thought if you were that afraid, you'd probably just kill over and die. But as I wrestled with fear, I found out that I could do something about it. I could contain it to a certain degree. You can never contain fear completely. But at least once I recognized that it was my fear, it wasn't other people making me afraid. And I think that was the key. It was my fear and I could mold it the way I wanted it to. So I made a bargain with fear. Fear and I came to an agreement. I will continue to go to school and you will not interfere with my goal-directed activities. So the fear would just be in my pocket. And I would pull it out when I needed it because sometimes you need fear. You need fear to alert you to danger, to prompt your mechanisms for survival. And so you run away from the thing that might kill you. And so we had this bargain and it worked out. Some call that courage. Well, however you look at it, it works. What about the other students, the other black students that you were going to this, uh, to Little Rock High School with? Um, was everybody equally afraid? Were some more afraid than others? Did... Uh, the fact that it was a group of you instead of just an individual, how did that affect your, your fear? Well, I, I think we were all afraid. We didn't really talk about it among ourselves that much, but we, we realized we were in the same boat. And so, yes, we were all afraid. But I think the nine of us, and by the way, we were nine, but the, originally uh, there had been about 150 volunteers. So we'd winnow down, mainly because of parental decisions not to allow their kids to be exposed to this danger. So I think because the parents, our parents, the ones who sent the nine, were of the opinion that it was worth the risk. So we didn't really talk about it so much, but we felt compelled to be there. And we felt no matter what happens, <clears throat> we're going to stay here. Although I must say, uh, I wanted to leave every second of every day. No question about it. I wanted to run out of there screaming and yelling. I've had enough. But something inside me suggested that perhaps I should rethink that, mainly based on the fact that the law had changed and also thousands of people who had lived before me had given their lives in this same struggle. I couldn't say no to what they had offered me as a gift. They had offered me the gift of their lives to go ahead and take the next step in this process of eliminating the barriers. Well, uh, it all sort of made sense to me. And I think 
I can speak for the entire group of nine saying, yes, we all pretty much felt the same way. And we were also afraid. So this decision that you and the other uh, students made to integrate Little Rock, to inter integrate Central High School in Little Rock, I'm curious about you, like, were, were you driving this decision or were your parents? In other words, did you say, I want to do this? And your parents said, uh, okay, we'll support you. Or did this, was this something that you and your parents came to jointly? No, the, the first thing you said was quite accurate. In fact, those very words. What happened was the Little Rock School Board made the decision to desegregate one school they then sent representatives to the two schools where black kids were. There was one middle school and one high school in Little Rock for all the black kids in town. They posed the question, we're going to desegregate Central High School in the fall. How many of you want to be a part of it? And at that point, jointly between the two schools, we had the 150 volunteers. Then we went home and explained to our parents that we had just volunteered to be part of the integration. Now you could hear the parental vetoes being exercised all over town. Loud noises erupted in households. No, no, no. But in the households of 10 of us, and for a brief moment in time, we were the Little Rock 10. Didn't last long, but there were 10 of us. And those parents said, yes. Now they probably had different reasons, but I think there was one constant thread throughout. And that was that we, been denied so long. And here, it at least, is an opportunity. We should take advantage of it. And that worked for, for nine parents going forward. In the case of the 10th child and their, her parents received a telephone call from his white employer with a very terse message saying, look, if you continue in this madness, thinking you can send your daughter to school with my kids, don't bother coming back to work. So there he was facing a threat of his economic lifeline. He pulled her out, but guess what? He lost his job anyway. The guy fired him anyway, which by the way, is something that I actually could have explained to him as a 15 year old because I knew the dynamics. I understood he had had the temerity to think he could send her. That was enough to send that employer over the edge. And so that's how the nine of us came to be, so to speak. So tell me, tell us about your parents uh, and uh, a little bit about them and why you think they supported your decision to do this. And uh, apparently your, your father didn't have these economic consequences that one of the members of the group had. So maybe tell us a little bit about your parents. Yes, I think uh, that's appropriate. Um, both my parents had been born in Little Rock in the same year. They were both born in 1920. And if you know a little bit about American history, you realize that that time, 1920, 1919, 2021, et cetera, was the height of the lynching that went on in this country. People were lynched all over the South. People were lynched in Little Rock. And I think as young people, they grew up with that. They didn't like it. They were frightened by it. And I think, and again, we didn't talk about this, but I think they probably felt here now in 1957, here was an opportunity. My mom actually did say something later. She said she sensed a window of opportunity that was now open, but she felt based on her own experience and her knowledge of the history of the country, that that window probably wouldn't be open very long. So we needed to go through it while we could. And when I came home and said, I have volunteered without missing a beat, they said to me, we will support your decision 100%. And if you get up there and it's too hot and you want to leave, we will support your decision to quit 100%. Now, at that point, I knew I had the best possible situation. I could stay or leave without fear of losing one iota of parental esteem. Now, that was really important. And I think that's one of the things that actually allowed me to stay there, knowing that I had an escape route if I needed it. That's really a remarkable thing for your parents to say to you. You know, I don't know that all of us have, you know, for you to have been so blessed to have parents like that. I mean, that's really um, kind of says a lot about who you are 
today? Well, they, they, were, they were rare, as I said, because, uh, uh, you know, 140 other parents uh, said no. In, in 1999, when Bill Clinton, also from Arkansas, spoke at your congressional gold medal ceremony, he said that you paid a price for your bravery in Little Rock. What did those words mean to you? And was he right? Well, I, I'm sure he was, because when I think about it, uh, anytime real change takes place in this country or any country for that matter, somebody has to be on the front line. And uh, sometimes it's your turn. I think I always felt in Little Rock that it was just my turn to take part. And as I mentioned earlier about the numbers of people who had died in the same struggle over the years, I had great respect for them, great deal of respect, still do for that matter. And it was important for me to accept the baton that they had passed to me. And my job, actually is to take that same baton and pass it off to someone else as I leave the stage. And, and I do a lot of speaking to young people about that these days, in fact, trying to encourage them to one, learn what the history of this country is all about, learn their part in it, and be willing to take up the mantle of leadership, not just for others, but for themselves and move forward. And in so doing, model for others what's possible. So. I think there are a lot of reasons to think about it in those terms. Tell us a little bit about the difference between the schools you went to in Arkansas in elementary school and middle school, and then when you went to Central High School in Little Rock. Because as we, we know, Plessy versus Ferguson said, you know, separate but equal was constitutional. So I wonder if you could sort of paint a picture for us about what the separate facilities were really like? Well, it's important to realize that when we use that language, separate but equal, the correct interpretation of it is separate and equal meaning what is equal for black people. It didn't mean true equality. It meant, for instance, in, in Little Rock, we had uh, at the time Dunbar High School. That school eventually became a middle school, but. When I was growing up, it was Dunbar High School, and it was considered by the school officials to be, and I quote, the finest school for Negroes in all the South. That's how they reckoned equality. It was good enough for black people. Now, Dunbar would not have been good enough for white people. No, no, because they had these very, very impressive edifices filled with all kinds of resources for kids. Central High School was a massive school. Some of you have seen pictures of that place. In fact, I think it was built probably in 1924 and received an award as being one of the most beautiful high schools in, little, in, the, in the whole US. It was indeed very impressive and uh, filled with all kinds of things that we didn't even think of at, at Dunbar, just didn't have it. So the allocation of funds was very differential. So if Central High School received $1,000, Dunbar would have a hundred. So 10 times more for the other school. When you were going to Central High School, were all of the Little Rock Nine, were all nine of you in each class each day, like, like sort of in the same classroom each day, or you know, some of you were different ages. So were you separated? Like maybe tell us a little bit about that. There were, Five of us that year who were high school juniors, three of us were sophomores, 10th graders, and one senior. So our class schedules were determined by our assignment to homerooms. Homeroom assignments were made alphabetically. So as it turned out, just coincidentally, none of our names alphabetically were near each other. So each of the nine of us were assigned a homeroom and we were the only black kid in that particular homeroom. So you might think of us that year, not so much as the Little Rock Nine, but the Little Rock One nine times. The homeroom assignment, as I said, determine your class schedule. So none of our classes were the same. I never had a class with another one of my fellow juniors. I was one of the five 11th graders. So we, we would see each other in the hallways 
or in the cafeteria or sometimes out on the playing field. But uh, generally speaking, we were fighting this war on our own most of the time. And by the way, another part of that, since it was determined that our safety was always at risk, we were not allowed to participate in any extracurricular activities. We had to sign an affidavit that we would not even think about signing up for any extracurricular activity. So once classes were finished, we had to vacate the premises. And because it was rather dangerous for us to be abroad on the streets, we had to leave as a group under, uh, with the protection you know, of someone driving us away from the school. If you could have participated in extracurricular activities, what would you have participated in? Everything. <laughs> and I say that because when I, once I got to uh, Los Angeles High School as a senior, I joined up uh, for everything. In fact, I, I sometimes look over the annual and I found myself looking at a picture of me in a group called the Red Cross Club. I couldn't even remember it. And I thought to myself, what on earth was I doing in the Red Cross Club? Well, I think it was because Whatever was open, I was signing up for it. So yeah, at LA High, I was all over the place. As a teenager, you faced a level of threatened violence that few teenagers are exposed to. How did you process that trauma? Has your training as a psychologist helped you uh, to process that trauma? Well, uh, I think I had an advantage going in, not of my own making, I think I came into the world with some DNA component that allowed me to achieve and, and retain a balance, uh, mentally uh, especially. Uh, as a young kid, you know, I, I don't, like I said, I don't know where it came from, but I had this ability to see things differently than most kids. A lot of my peer groups got caught up in fights because they were responding to taunts and name calling. And I looked at that and I thought, that's not very efficacious. Uh, there must be a way besides fighting. Because one thing I had, I didn't like fighting. See, fighting means you might get hurt. And I didn't want any part of that. So if someone came up to me and started talking trash or playing the dozens, as they called it, I would listen. I gave them the courtesy of making eye contact and, and being, you know, very kindly in my responses. But I would say things like, well, you know what you're saying absolutely has no basis in truth. In fact, if you're willing, you can come home with me and I'll show you. My mom doesn't even own combat boots. I'll let you look in her closet. And that sort of diffused a lot of stuff. And, and it worked for me. And so I kept doing that. And even at Central, uh, although I didn't say much because these kids weren't willing to hear me, but mentally I would do things. So I had a rating scale for the creativity of the insults I heard. See, I knew two things. One, that had nothing to do with me. This was other people telling me who they were. They were telling me perhaps that they didn't like me, perhaps they hated me, they wanted to kill me. I don't know, I, it's hard for me to interpret everything, but I just assumed this was going on, but I wanted no part of that. But what I did wanna do was to figure out a way to use the time. So I would rate them based on the creativity, scale of one to 10, one, not very good, 10, wow, I might use that myself. But nobody rated higher than two the whole year. Uh, they were not very good. They weren't very creative, honestly. I recall one, one Tuesday thinking, I should tell this guy, that's the same kind of nigger you called me yesterday. Where's your creative urge? Well, they didn't get it and I didn't enlighten them, but that helped me to get through. Uh, speaking of that, I also used uh, poetry. I'm a real fan of poetry because poetry seems to speak to the emotions at such a deep level. And there was this one poem called Invictus, which I would recite to myself. Now, Invictus is a, a poem that some of the people here watching today may be familiar with. I have grown spiritually way apart from that poem, but at the time it had a lot of meaning. So, uh, certainly you were taunted and, and threatened at this high school. Were there any students there that you be, any white students that you became friends with? Well, I'm, I'm glad you asked the question because it gives me a chance to talk about the fact that whenever there's a group of people, you will never ever find complete unanimity of thought. Right. 
So in that group at Central, there were students there, not a lot, but a few students who actually felt that we should have a right to be there. They were reluctant to speak out because the sanctions were so severe. The word was out on the school ground that if you befriend the black kids or speak to them in any way, we will kill you too. So few, few kids were willing to confront that. A few did. The one who stands out for me is a young woman who was in my algebra class, Robin Woods. Robin was remarkable. I would show up in class often with no books or papers or pencils. All of those things would be kicked out of my arms and destroyed more often than not. So I'm sitting there naked and Robin pulled her desk over and shared her algebra book with me. I don't think she realized that she was now igniting one of the biggest infernos of response because she was in close proximity, a young white female in close proximity to a young black male, that was one of the biggest taboos. She was oblivious to that. She just, and what happened, as I found out later, she and her sister grew up in a one parent home, their mom, but their mom was a very Christian woman. She taught those girls the principles of treating everybody in the universe as their peer. And that's what Robin was operating on. And so, no, she had no problem, but she was, she was alone, even among the few who reached out in some way. Some of the others were much less overt in their response, but you can see it in their eyes, which often were quickly averted because they were fearful that they might be caught. But yes, uh, there were some among the teachers as well who did that. But like yeah, I said, not many. Most of them yeah, tended to cluster at the far end of a continuum. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about your experience with the teachers at the high school, did they, did they refer to you in a derogatory way? Did they make fun of you? I mean, how can you tell us a little bit about the, how the teachers treated you? Well, you, you have to understand that the, uh, all of these teachers had been well steeped in the ideology of racism. They were not friendly in the main. But again, they were arrayed along a continuum. You had a few at the one end who thought maybe we should have a chance, but most of them clustered at the other end where they tended to hate us with vile passion. Uh, one example stands out. My English teacher confronted me one day. She said in a very harsh, harsh tones, she said, why do you wanna to come to our school? Why don't you go back to your own school? And I just looked at her thinking to myself, this woman obviously has a mental health problem. She is inferring that the two of us have some sort of ownership in these public institutions. She's supposed to be a teacher. I didn't feel like we could have a true conversation, so I didn't respond. I just smiled and walked off. I've since come to appreciate smiling and walking off as my response to the idiocy wherever I hear it, which was pretty good learning in that 11th grade English class. But you know, the funny thing is, uh, I, I suspected that I would receive an F in her class because on day one, when I walked in, her face told me that. Her face said, I don't like you and you're getting an F. I didn't do anything about it because what power did I have? But I was mildly shocked at the end of term, I got an A in English, an A, can you imagine? Well, I shared that with a friend of mine and he started laughing. Uh, uh, uncontrollably. It took a while for him to compose himself. And he said, don't you know what happened? That woman wanted to ensure that you never ever showed up in her class again. That's why you got the A. And I thought, well, that's one way to look at it. The other way is that she just couldn't deny genius when she saw it. That was my preferred interpretation. Uh, uh, how did, when you went to this high school, You'd gone to segregated schools before this. When you got to this high school, Central High School, how did you feel your academic preparation stacked up with the white students there? You know, and I, I sort of asked this in the sense of like, uh, whatever, you, you go to one high school and then somebody then goes to a, a fancy private school and, you know, maybe there's a difference in what the kids have, have learned. Well, uh, in, the high, in the elementary, the middle school, and the one year of high school I went to in the segregated system, I got what I often 
describe as a superior education. Now you have to understand that in the American South, not in every single place, no, I, I doubt seriously if in the deep Delta in Mississippi, you had these uh, factors going, but in Little Rock, considered to be a part of the upper South for all that that matters, black people who were teachers and principals and administrators at schools were seething with anger because they couldn't get jobs in their chosen professions, but they could teach. And so we had a cadre of the very best trained teachers and they had resolved to make certain that we students pursued excellence in terms of learning. They demanded a lot of us and it worked. In fact, there's a, a reference book and I can't remember the name or the authors now, but they're graduates of Dunbar High School. And it shows how the graduates of Dunbar High School from Little Rock tended to fare much better than their age group counterparts in other parts of the country based on what they had gotten in those schools. So we were well prepared. In fact, I often say that the kids at Central would have benefited going to the all black schools as I did so that they could be more fully prepared for life. They missed out on a lot. And so for me, going to Central meant that one, I didn't have to exert myself because they were not as advanced as we were in terms of learning. Now they felt superior. They had you know, glommed onto this notion that because of whiteness, they mattered more than we did. Not true. And I think some of them actually knew that and were angrier as a consequence. I think a lot of the violence I faced was born out of that thought. We have been taught that these kids are not as good as we are and yet here they are not having to work as hard in class as we do. And they didn't like it, so they decided to kill us. It's very odd when you think about it. Do you think that the grades you received when you were at Central High School were, were fair? Do you, know, do you think the teachers graded your efforts fairly? Do you think they um, gave you lower grades than you deserved because you were black or, or the opposite, or you know, gave you higher grades because they didn't want to see you back in their class next year? What, what do you well, think? I was thinking about that English grade. Uh, you know, I deserved an A in all of my classes. I know this. Uh, but I wound up that year with two A's and two B's. So I could make a case that those two B's were, you know, ill designed, but I didn't push the point. In fact, uh, I think it's difficult for teachers to actually grade students because they really don't know what's going on. All they have is what is turned in by way of assignments and so forth. And those could have been done by parents for that matter. But uh, I think, so taking on executive responsibility as I did as a young kid, I always knew that I needed to learn as much as I could. So if a teacher assigned me a book to read, I would not only read that book, but I would read any book that seemed remotely associated with it that I could get my hands on to be fully prepared. That was my whole approach. Is that what you, so when you say executive responsibility, uh, what, what do you mean by that phrase? Well, two things. One, don't expect the teacher to teach you anything. Use the teacher as a resource, but commit yourself to learning what you need to learn. Second part of that is there is so much knowledge and information out there. No one teacher could possibly have it all. So you take what you get from that teacher, but you augment it with information that you gather from other sources. So I spent a lot of time in the libraries. In fact, at Central High School, I spent a lot of my time in the Central High School library, not just for uh, learning, but also it was a place where the librarian didn't tolerate anybody picking on us. So it was a safe zone. It just worked out that the safe zone was also my favorite place. I just think this idea is, is interesting that that um, the teachers, some of the teachers and the students have the the false belief that that they're better, they're smarter than you because they're white. And now you're in the classroom and you're, you know, getting the same assignments that they are. And now the teacher's in the position of having to to decide whether to treat you fairly treat you equally in the sense of judging you based on the quality of your work and not the color of your skin 
And it's interesting to see how the teachers respond. It reminds me a little bit when, you know, when athletes broke the color line, you know, when, when Jackie Robinson, you know, broke into the major leagues, were the umpires going to make the calls fairly with respect to him, or were they going to cheat in some way? So um, do you think that the teachers were sort of treated you fairly? And do you think they were surprised? Do you think some of them were surprised at how smart and well-prepared you were? Well, I think, I think all of that's true. I think all of that's true. Uh, like I said, these teachers were aligned along a continuum. They didn't all think the same way but they tended to cluster at that end where they really didn't like us. And so I imagine, like you mentioned Jackie Robinson, they did, did the same thing to Arthur Ashe in tennis where the obvious calls were, I mean, anybody could see these were wrong calls, but Arthur's response was just to play on, keep playing because he knew in the end, his talent would win out. And so it was at, at Central. Now, Jeff Thomas, who was in 10th grade, told us about his physics instructor, his physics teacher, gave him broken equipment to use to do his experiments. But Jeff didn't flinch. He didn't give any sign that he had a problem with that. He simply took his assignments to the all black college, Philander Smith College, which was there in Little Rock, worked his experiments out there and came back and pretended to use the broken equipment. He said, I had to miss a few questions now and then though, so I didn't break my cover. <laughs> Uh, before we, we move to um, you coming to Los Angeles, uh, tell me about, you've been very successful um, since uh, leaving Central High School and you know been very accomplished. Can you tell us a little bit about the other eight in your group and uh, did they you know kind of become as, uh, do as well as you did? Well, you know, this was a, a fairly elite group when you think about it. Uh, we were all good students. Uh, I can't say that we were <clears throat> one smarter than the other, but we were all very, very involved in this whole process of learning. And our academic and scholastic record attached to that uh, in terms of what we've done with that. So all of us are college graduates. Uh, some of us have graduate degrees and a lot of us have written books. So yeah. Uh, it was a, a very special, it is a very special group. By the way, there are only eight of us who remain. Jeff died over 11 years ago now. And that his story bears re repeating here because he had to go fight in Vietnam. He'd already had this war in Central. I thought it was a little unfair that he had to go to Vietnam. And yet he went over there and succumbed to the impact of Agent Orange and a lot of those defoliants. He, he was never really physically the same after he came back. So he died a fairly early death. But yeah, I think, uh, you know, when you look at the record we've all put together, it's fairly impressive for nine kids, but not unusual, going back to what I said about graduates from Dunbar in general. Sometimes I think you could have closed your eyes and plucked out any nine kids and it would have had the same result. Dr. Roberts, I just have to ask you, um, and, and I, I talked to you a little bit a few days ago, uh, you do not, uh, express or show anger, uh, hatred. And I, I just sort of wonder, you know, you talked about taking the fear and making a bargain with the fear that I'll, I'm going to put this in my pocket. I'm not going to let it stop me from my goals. I'm going to use the fear when I need to, because sometimes you need to respond to fear. But I just, uh, I think speaking for a lot of us, we would be very angry about a lot of things that happened. And I wonder uh, if you were angry about a lot of things, if you experienced that and how you have dealt with that, because you, you don't come across, right, as a, as, a, as a bitter person in any way. And I just wonder how you did that. Well, you know, that's a very good question. In fact, I recall an interview I had at UCLA I was there, a young student, a member of the uh, editorial staff, I suppose, of the Daily Bruin. She came to interview me about my life in Little Rock and she posed a question and we'd been going along very well. And then she asked the question, what do you do with your hatred toward white people? And I you know, pondered the question. 
And I said, well, I, I really don't have any. And she laughed. She laughed and then she reiterated the question. She said, come on, come on. What do you do with your hatred toward white people? And again, I said, well, I don't have any. At that point, she slammed her notebook, closed, stood up and in anger said to me, I can't go on with this interview if you're gonna lie to me. And she walked out. And I thought to myself, that's a missed opportunity. Had she pursued it, I would have been able to explain to her how I arrived at that decision not to hate white people, but she didn't. So that never got printed. <laughs> but fact is, as a very, very young person, probably before I was a teenager, I had ongoing conversations with my mom about how to respond to life in general, to racial hatred in particular. And she said, you could respond in kind if you so desired, but I tell you, you don't have to. There are other options. She said, you are an animal. This is true, but you are a human animal and human animals have an advantage. They have the power of speech. They can negotiate, they can compromise. They can choose to do things differently. She said, you could still become angry if you wanted to, but I tell you this, that anger will use up life force and you don't have a lot of it. You have about enough life force to sustain you for the entirety of your life. Now you could fritter some of it away and being angry and hateful. I don't recommend it. So that's where I got my first inkling about the possibilities and I pursued that. So by the time I got to Central High School, I was ready to forgive anybody on the spot, a priori if necessary, because I didn't want to use up my life force dealing with that. That's very profound. Uh, you, you completed your last year of high school in Los Angeles after Governor Faubus shut down public schools in Arkansas. What was different about coming to the West Coast and attending an integrated high school? Were there any echoes of the racism you experienced in Little Rock? Well, one thing to point out that uh, LA High was not integrated. It was desegregated. There's a difference. Okay, tell us about that. Yeah. Integration speaks to each person having the same rights and privileges of everyone else in the system. That was not true at LA High. That was not true in Los Angeles. There's this myth that somehow bigotry, racism, racial hatred, all exist in abundance in quote, the American South. And we're usually talking about the Southeastern states, Georgia, Alabama, Florida, even Arkansas, Mississippi, et cetera. Truth is, that's not the way it is. In fact, if you wanna use that metaphor, the South, we can apply it to every state in the union. In fact, some have said that the South is truly any place South of Canada. I believe that. So when I got to LA, it wasn't a matter of leaving the South, it was going to the Western region, Western region of the South. And racism LA style was different. You know, a lot of different flair, sort of laid back in LA. Not so much, I wanna kill you, but hey, bro, I don't like you. You know, that sort of thing. <laughs> uh, I found it out right in LA High. In fact, I, wanted, I joined the choir. Like I said, I joined everything. I was in the choir. I wanted to take the lead role. I wanted to sing the lead role in the school play. Choir director, a white woman, pulled me aside and said, we don't allow black kids to have the lead. I don't know where she got that authority, but she seemed very confident that that was the case. I didn't get the lead. In fact, uh, Bob Obramowitz wound up getting the lead role. I could out sing Bob even now, probably. <laughs> I knew that. But you know, you, you deal with stuff as you find it. I didn't, I didn't pursue the matter. Uh, wasn't the hill I was willing to die on. So you had too many battles. You can't fight everyone. Why did you leave Central High? Was it because, the gov because of what the governor decided in terms of closing the public schools? Like what led you to go to Los Angeles? Oh, exactly, exactly. I had no understanding about whether or not the schools would ever reopen. So I took a, an invitation from relatives who lived in LA and wanted to continue my education. Now, fortunately, the schools did reopen the following year, but what happened during that lost year, they called it, a number of kids never got back into school. 
And I, you know, that could have been me. I could have been me being thrown out of the system for whatever reason. But I didn't want to take that chance. I didn't want to leave myself open to the temptation of life without school. Uh, but a number of my age group peers uh, simply never got a high school diploma, which rendered them practically ineligible to continue in this formal educational pattern. That's not the most egregious example of that kind of behavior. Prince Edward County, Virginia, schools there were closed for four consecutive years. And not just high schools, elementary, middle and high schools, all closed for four years running. Talk about a devastating impact upon a community. You know, I've talked to some of the people who grew up in that area and they are still bitter about the fact that they had no access to school because this was public schools closing and they didn't have money for private schools. They didn't have funds to travel or a place to go even. So they were stuck. And many of them wound up uh, getting into all kinds of stuff, drugs or young women becoming pregnant or you know, sometimes uh, getting into things that just made no sense because there were no schools available. So when you say that the governor in Arkansas and then also in, in Prince Edward in Virginia closed the public schools, meaning the, the black and white public schools and then the black kids, unless they had means, could not go to school, the white kids who had means could then go to private school. Is that sort of what, what Absolutely. happened? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's what happened. And when you go to Little Rock or Arkansas today, you will so find some of the most magnificent private schools for white kids still in existence. It started during that era. And this was true across the country as well, that uh, white kids had the option, many of them, not all of them, but many of them had the option of going to private schools. And many of those private schools were developed and built just for that purpose. Uh, in fact, when you think about it, since this country has no taste or commitment to integration at all, we find that same pattern continuing you find schools designed to keep kids of color out and keep white kids in. This is going on in 2021, no different. Was that hard for your parents to send you to the West Coast to send no, their son? No, no, in fact, they followed me. In December ah. of that same year, 58, the whole family moved. In fact, uh, I often think about something we should have done that we didn't, we should have stopped at the border of Arkansas and burned our visas, <laughs> uh, if we had had any, going back to Arkansas. I had no intent of ever going back to Little Rock. But uh, as it turned out, uh, I've made lots of trips back to Little Rock. In fact, I don't know if I told you this, but the Little Rock School District hired me as a desegregation consultant in 1998. Now think about this. 1998, that's a date far removed from the 50s, right? Why are they still dealing with that stuff? Well, they were, and they had no real intent to change. They were not hiring me in a, in a, a real positive sense to do anything. They wanted to dangle me out as PR fodder for the public to say, hey, we're actually working on this. We've actually hired Terry Roberts. He's one of the Little Rock Nine, see, we're good. Well, I knew the truth of that. I actually confronted the school superintendent and I told him, I said, you know, you're not telling me the truth. What's really going on here? And he just laughed. Oh, oh, yeah, we're telling the truth. We're committed. I knew he was lying. So I kept pressing him. I said, finally, look, uh, I'll take this job. But I want you to give me a list of all the known bigots in your system. I'll start with them because they'll probably present the most opposition. He laughed again. He said, oh, no, we don't have any bigots. And we're talking about the Little Rock school system. How can you not have bigots, right? Anyway, I took the job anyway, and I told him, look, I'm taking the job, but you're gonna find out what I've been doing. At some point, you're gonna fire me. He laughed again. He was so good at laughing. So I took the job and sure enough, four years later, he fired me <laughs> because he wasn't happy with what I was doing. What were you able to accomplish in those four years? Well, believe it or not, uh, I submitted a proposal. I took a few months to just do investigation and I figured out that this system was so broken, we needed to have every single individual go through some sort of a personal reformation, confronting self about issues of race and racist ideology. And, you know, I put it together and I submitted it to the board and they sat on it. They didn't even respond. Long time, months go by. At the end of nine months, I decided 
in my thinking, well, nine months, a proper gestation period, anything. So it's time to give birth to this. So I got myself on the agenda for the school board meeting, which was televised on local cable. And they were a bit nervous. They came to me and said, well, what are you going to say? What are you going to say? I said, well, I'm just going to give an update on my activities. Oh, okay. So I, I did. I gave an update of my activities. But then at the end of that, I mentioned the proposal, gave a bit of a summary of it, and said, I submitted it nine months ago, but I've not heard. And then the meeting was over. I get back to my hotel room. The phone's ringing off the hook. School officials calling me. Why did you out us like that? Why did you do that? I feigned ignorance. Well, I just gave an update. But public pressure was brought to bear, and they were forced to resurrect that proposal. And I was able to run five or 600 people through it before they fired me. So in that sense, we made a bit of progress, if you call it that. I, I don't really call it progress. It's just one of those, you know, one step in the 99,000 step process to get to the goal. Well, it's interesting that you said they brought you in as a desegregation consultant, not as an integration consultant. You know, exactly. so they, they had a, I see. The, the district judge, Ronald Davies, uh, was the U.S. district judge who ordered the desegregation, desegregation of Central High School. You attended those hearings. Why was it important for you to be there and see those proceedings in court? Well, for, for two reasons. One, to support Judge Davies, because he was under heavy pressure not to rule in our favor. And the second reason was to watch this process up close, to see exactly what went on in this democratic society. Now, Judge Davies stands out. He's such an important individual in all of this because he was adamant. His rulings uh, didn't take long. He would hear the evidence, and 15 minutes later, he had a ruling. Go forward, go forward. And he received death threats. His life was threatened. His family's life was threatened. He was fortunately from North Dakota, so he could go back home. None of the other judges closer to Little Rock would touch the case. They were so afraid that they would be, you know, treated the same way as Judge Davies. But yeah, he was a remarkable man, and I appreciate so much what he did. But he simply modeled for other jurists what's possible. And that's another thing, you know, in terms of our American system, we don't have time to get in that today, but that's a real issue going forward. So uh, recently in the last couple of years in our country, uh, we've seen a rise in racially motivated crimes of violence and domestic terrorism. Uh, just to recap a little bit in 2019, a gunman shot and killed 23 shoppers at a Walmart. Uh, this was in, I think, San Antonio. Uh, he targeted them because they were Latino. It was the deadliest attack on Latinos in American history, modern American history. Uh, hate crimes against Jews rose 14% uh, last year to just under 1,000, making them the most targeted religious group. Uh, Anti-Asian violence increased significantly during this pandemic, particularly with our former president calling it the China virus. It feels in a lot of ways, and, and I should just say, and you, you may not be aware of this, in our own county, in the south part of our county in Gilroy, we had a mass shooting a couple of years ago, and the gunman uh, was also, it was a racially motivated attack. Uh, it feels in some ways that we are moving uh, backwards instead of forwards. To what do you attribute this rise in violence? And how do we keep the forward momentum going and build on that? Actually, I, I see it a little differently. Um, I don't see it as a rise in violence. I see it as a continuation of what has been going on for centuries. And as long as there are forces insistent that we resurrect the ideology of racism, which we have always embraced, it's going to continue. You know, I sometimes marvel and how we as a country of people can be so absolutely blind to the facts. We have not said anything differently. We've said this over and over, this is who we are. And other people hear that and I think they reinterpret it and say, well, they're really not saying that. Uh, I guess the best example that comes to mind is this guy, Donald Trump. When he came down the escalator announcing his decision to run for president, 
He told us the absolute truth about who he was and is. I knew it right away. Other people said, oh, well, no, no, at some point he's going to quote act presidential. How on, how on earth could he possibly act presidential? It would have certainly have to have been an act, I know that. It wouldn't have been anything genuine. But if somebody is willing to say explicitly who they are, and by the way, I happen to know that we always do that. We always tell the truth about who we are, no matter the language or the tone or the sentiments we use, we can see that if we're looking for it. And here's one man who was so explicitly telling us, this is who I am, and yet a large number of us voted for him. I've actually taken the opportunity when I talk to groups of people to inquire of the audience, how many of you cast a vote for Donald Trump? And if there are anyone in the audience willing to raise their hand, I make an appointment with them to talk afterwards. And I've done that. I've talked with some people. It's been enlightening for me to find out exactly what they base their decision upon. And I tell you, most of those decisions are based on things that are very shallow and root. They, they don't really say much in terms of foundational principles. And I chalk that up to the fact that in this country, we are content to have a nation of airheads. Most people aren't encouraged to really learn. Uh, and I, I know why that is. I know why that is because the captains of industry want workers who don't challenge. They want cheap labor and you know they can't have and afford people who are smart enough to demand unions or some sort of a group bargaining to get the best possible deal. That's just one, by the way, one reason of many, but that is you know, very complicated in that sense, but not so much complicated that you can't figure out the reasons for it. Greed yep. and selfishness at the base. So I think it was, I think it was Maya Angelou who said, when people tell you, when people show you who they are, tell you who they are, believe them. Exactly. Right? I, I, think, I think that I, was her. I, I embrace I, that. Right. And it's, it's interesting. Your experiences at the high school, when these white students, you know, are, are calling you names and, and are threatening you, and you sort of took it as, um, you, student who's yelling these terrible things at me, you're really telling me about you and who you are and what your right. values are. And the way in which you responded is really your way of telling them, this is who I am. Like I'm, uh, I'm, observing, uh, I'm observing you, uh, I'm, I'm rating your creativity, uh, but I'm, I'm not gonna debase myself. You know, that sort of seems how you dealt with that. No, I think, I think you sum it up quite well. Uh, I'm reminded of a situation. I went to Southern Illinois for grad school. Uh, my family and I were there for three years. When I moved in, that first week, one of my neighbors came over uh, because we, we bought a home. It was very in interesting, you know, going from California to Southern in terms of home prices. Even as a graduate student, I could afford to buy a house. The houses were so inexpensive. But he came over and he said, um, I want you to know that you have three strikes against you. I said, oh, really, what are they? He said, well, the first thing is you're from California. It was interesting that that was the first strike. Being from California, he said, I understand even the men out there wear shorts. And I, well, I had to agree with him. <laughs> but he said, now, the second thing is you're connected with the university. And there had been this ongoing problem, town gown controversy, if you will. And the third thing is, he said, you're black. And because you're black, if I were you, I would not go into the town of Heron after sundown. Now, Heron is adjacent to Carbondale. So I thanked him, you know, for, you know, letting me know how many strikes I had and what they were about. So I went home and told my wife, it was about dusk, sun was just going down. I said, throw on a sweater, we're gonna drive over to Heron. She says, why? I said, no, no big deal, we're just gonna check it out. So, but it was based on my thought that if you have information that Heron might be problematic, you need to see for yourself what the problem looks like. I call it identifying the dragon in your neighborhood. See, it's prudent. If you think there's a dragon, if someone tells you there's a dragon, you need to see the dragon in his lair to figure out how you're gonna contend with it. Well, we drove over there and I found out it was just, you know, people who were, I call them garden variety racist. No big deal, I was accustomed to that. 
<clears throat> so we felt a little more comfortable when we came home. And I didn't have real problems. I mean, we had incidents, of course, in town, but if you know how to deal with it, actually the people in Carbondale came to regard us as being foreigners. They said, y'all from, not from around here, are you? That was sort of our, <laughs> our note that they were, they had already, you know, categorized us as being people they couldn't bother because we weren't from around there. It was okay. That, that's quite um, amazing, actually, Dr. Roberts, that someone tells you uh, to stay away from a certain town after dusk because it's not safe for black people. I think most people, I'm just going to guess, would, 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 you know what, I'm going to avoid Heron after sundown. Like, I, I think that's how most people would respond. I particularly think people with your background and experience of seeing virulent and experiencing virulent racism, it would be understandable if you just avoided Heron. So that's quite remarkable that you thought, you know what, uh, rather than building up Heron in my mind as so, so awful and terrible, let me see it. And, you know, maybe it's something that I can be able to manage or navigate and it's not as terrifying as uh, this person is painting it for me. Like that's, don't you think that's, I don't think a lot of well, people or, do that. Or you find out <clears throat> that it is terrifying, but in either case, you need to know. You need to know for yourself the degree to which you are in danger. Well, that sort of goes back to the, one of the main themes in your life about taking responsibility for learning and trying to dent the storehouse of ignorance uh, that we all have and to try to learn as much as possible. So my last question to you before I turn it over to Lee is, of course, you're speaking to a group of uh, prosecutors and police officers and uh, criminalists and support staff in the district attorney's office who are a part of law enforcement. Uh, what role do you think we have or should play in uh, promoting social justice? Well, uh, this is a topic that would require uh, another session altogether, but we will- Now, you sound, like, now you sound like a psychologist. I'm sorry, <laughs> Jeff, our time is up. <laughs> no, but the truth is it's, it's a big subject. You know, I've done a lot of work with law enforcement personnel in, in my career, especially recently, uh, being an adjunct faculty member at the Simon Wiesenthal Center we do uh, programs especially designed for law enforcement officers. We do work with uh, police forces, including LAPD and others, uh, some from your area. You know, there are people from Santa Clara who come down. Uh, we work with uh, FBI, we work with uh, ICE agents <clears throat> because the, the enormity of the problem is, is there. Everybody knows how important this is. As visible evidence or visible uh, signs that we do need somebody to help us obey the laws, you know, keep ourselves out of trouble. But we've not done a good job of it. Uh, part of it, as I've discovered, is most people in law enforcement don't really have a sense or, of understanding about the historical development of law enforcement itself in this country. I've quizzed policemen who come for some of our groups and ask in the academy, how much did you learn about the history of policing? In some cases, they say nothing. In some cases, they get a token or they get a book assigned or something. But to truly know and understand who you are in the present, you have to know what went on before. I taught a course of graduate students at UCLA once, and I just casually mentioned the fact that given our criminal justice system, because it's set up the way it is, uh, there's a certain percentage of people who are incarcerated who have committed no crime. And I was shocked when I got the feedback from the students, they were outraged. How can you say that? We have a fair system. Nobody goes to jail who's innocent. I said, really? Then it was my turn to be shocked because they didn't know it. I'm thinking, how could they get to graduate school and not know that we have people who, because of the way our system is set up, run the risk of being sent to jail, whether they have been charged, whether found guilty of a crime, truly found guilty or not. Well, uh, I thought, okay, now my job is to help them 
best I can come to that realization. But there was pushback, reluctance for them to even consider the fact that our system is imperfect. But it's true, it's quite true. I don't know what the exact percentage is, but certainly now with some of the projects we see going on, the innocence projects, we've proven the point. There are some people who are innocent of the crime of which, with which they are charged. Now, this is not to say that guilty of other crimes. We're all guilty of crimes, you know. I, I could be thrown in jail on any given day uh, if you really enforce the law. But the fact is that we need a system where people understand this and so they can temper this injustice with some mercy to find out uh, during the interim. And then we can work toward finding a system that, that actually works. And I don't know what that system is. I'm not saying I have the answer, but I say we could have that conversation we could talk about that. I remember doing uh, some work with a group of criminal attorneys I'd been called in and we were talking about the impact of stress on their lives. And a couple of the people came to me and said, we don't, we don't need you. We don't need you to talk about stress or eliminating stress. We need stress. We need that stress. I said, why? And one man said, look, I've been a criminal uh, defense attorney for 30 or 40 years. And before each trial, I go into the bathroom and throw up. I'm so stressed out. I said, well, why are you that stressed out? He said, because there's a chance that my client will be found guilty. Whether he's guilty or not, there's a chance that he could be found guilty. I thought, wow, that's pretty profound. But that's the kind of thing we're dealing with. Uh, I think we really do need to have a conversation about how we can change our system. And not just by going in the streets and demanding that the police be defunded or that sort of thing. But I'm talking about an honest conversation with all parties involved, where we really consider what we've been doing to each other. Uh, you know, unfortunately, we have a reputation in this country of being the one country that incarcerates more people than any other country. Uh, that's not a thing to be proud of. Um, so, um, Dr. Roberts, such a pleasure for me to get to have this conversation with you. I, I thought your remarks at the end about trying to temper justice with mercy is something that I think I think all of us are are constantly uh, balancing and uh, trying to bring into our work as prosecutors and police officers. I think that's so uh, important. And so now I'm going to uh, turn it over to uh, Lee Frazier to uh, ask you some of the questions that have arisen while we've been talking. And I notice you haven't drank any water. Like, are, are, you, are you being held hostage in that room? Are they, can you? Uh, oh, no, no. I, uh, <laughs> I hydrated before. Okay. All and right. I have I'll... cough drops. In fact, here's, I have another one. I'll use it now. That helps. <laughs> okay. All right. I'll turn it over to Lee. Lee? Thank you, Jeff. Uh, some people submitted questions uh, in advance, uh, and if there are any watchers who have questions, you can type them into the chat box, and I'll read them for uh, Dr. Roberts. Uh, several people submitted questions about de facto segregation, um, and I'll just use um, Central High School as an example. It was at one time 100% white. After desegregation, uh, many white parents moved away from the area. They sent their children to recently sprung up private schools uh, that you mentioned um, and found ways to legally resegregate their children. I was talking to a, a colleague who's a graduate of Central High School who said that the school uh, despite the fact that it offers a top-notch education, advanced placement classes, uh, what she would consider to be a superior education, it's 70% Black um, in a city where Black people are not in the majority. So in a, in a way, it has resegregated to, to a certain extent. Um, 60 years have passed and this is still happening. Is this a fight that can be won? No. This is not a fight that can be won until and unless we as Americans decide that we really want a sea change. Years ago, I attended a lecture by Kenneth Clark, noted African-American psychologist. He came to UCLA 
I sat on the front row, had a fresh legal pad, sharpened pencil. I wanted to take notes. But as he talked, I found that I didn't need to take any notes. I understood I had lived everything he was talking about. I'm waiting for something new. But at the end of his talk, he said he thought that white Americans would devise ways to live in the ocean before they ever agree to equal housing opportunities. And I thought to myself as I left that session, wow, that's not very encouraging. But on the drive home, it occurred to me that it wasn't discouraging. He was simply stating an obvious fact, but he was still committed to the fight. And he showed that by his ongoing life. And so we're still though at that point. We're at a point where white Americans in the main will do whatever is needed to maintain the wall of separation. The neighborhood I live in right now in Pasadena is considered to be, and get this, an all white neighborhood. Can you believe that? And when I hear that, I stand up. I said, well, we live there. It's not all white. In fact, it's a black neighborhood with a preponderance of white residents. It's just a matter of perspective, how you look at it. But that whole thing about occupied space in this country is just one example of how we maintain these walls. There's sort of this known entity. When my grandsons visited some years ago, when they were quite small, uh, we had issues because they were, quote, unfamiliar kids in the neighborhood. So we had a whole lot of neighborly interest in who they were. And my youngest grandson was followed home. He was on his scooter going around the block by himself. And he had an entourage, well, I called it an entourage, it was one car, really following him home because this woman wanted to see if he actually was telling the truth that he lived here. Interesting stuff. You just triggered a memory for me for me from many, many years ago of a conversation I had with your wife, who was uh, one of my history professors in college. And she said to me that one of her neighbors had come up to her with a lot, a white neighbor had come up to her with a lot of concern because uh, the white neighbor said that she saw a black man running through the neighborhood um, and, and expressed shock about it, which I, I think your, your wife's um, response was very diplomatic to that uh, because I believe she said something to the effect of, well, why would that concern you? <laughs> And uh, um, uh, it was uh, uh, many years ago, but I, re I recall uh, Professor Roberts and I having that conversation. Well, that was an interesting uh, interlude because um, that was another neighborhood, not the house we live in right now, but the first house we lived in was very strange because when we moved in, that same neighbor came over and before she introduced herself, said to us, uh, I want you to know I voted for you in the Neighborhood Watch Council meeting. Well, I said to her, well, thank you, you know, for your loyalty. Would you mind telling us what that vote was about? And she did. She said, well, the neighbors got together and they wanted to see if they really supported your being here. And we never found out the vote count. Uh, we think we may have squeaked through. Uh, nobody came with shotguns to throw, throw us out. But life there was not the best. Uh, we hung in there for 10 years and we finally moved to this other neighborhood which is similar. <laughs> uh, Pasadena is very interesting. You know, the history here, like many cities, Pasadena was a sundown city. Some of you know that concept. Sundown city being that city where if you're black or brown, you have no right to be in the city limits after sundown. So Pasadena is still coping with that. But we're working on it. I went to an integrated high school um, but even at an integrated high school, I felt the divide. Um, the advanced placement classes were all white. And um, when I wanted to take an advanced placement class, there was a wall of resistance to get into it. I recall an English teacher whom I'd never met before telling my mother that uh, AP English would be too challenging for me. And this is a story that I've heard from other black and brown students that even when they go to schools that are considered integrated, there is still that divide there. Is this something that, that you've heard before and how do you respond to it? Oh yeah, yeah, I, I, I hear that. 
all the time. Uh, years ago, I read a book by Lorraine Carey called Black Ice. And it's her story of her uh, going to a posh private school. She and her brother were there together. And that same kind of issue came up for them. Uh, they were in an environment where the majority of students and faculty didn't think they belonged. So she writes about how they responded to it. And what you experience is not atypical, unfortunately. And again, in 2021, it's continues. It's not something that is past history. It's an ongoing part of how we deal with quote others in our life. And while we're on that topic, and this just occurred to me, uh, recently I heard about this concept of something called white allies. I don't know about that. I've since I've checked it out and there are even programs, there are people teaching white allies how to be allies, all of which I disavow. You see, I don't, I don't think having that, that, that supports the we, they dichotomy, the us versus them notion. We don't need that. We need to move beyond that. We need to think of us. We need to think about how we as Americans, not we as black Americans or white Americans, but we as Americans are gonna deal with this stuff. And whatever two black people in this country is not isolated, it involves everybody. So if you're gonna be involved in a fight, you're not an ally, you're a soldier. Um, a young kid asked me recently if I, uh, what my feelings were about Black Lives Matter. I said, well, young man, I consider myself to have been inducted into the Black Lives Matter movement on December 3rd, 1941. And I've been an active soldier since. And I will die with my, you know, insignia. <clears throat> but that movement goes by different names in different centuries. It's the same. It's not different. Black Lives Matter is not a different movement, simply the current iteration. Uh, in a few years, we'll have something else. And I feel confident in saying that because I don't think, based on what I've seen thus far, that we're gonna make a sea change overnight. Uh, but in any case, yeah, that, that experience is important to, to have people understand and know about. So many things, my mind's swirling with stuff, but I don't wanna take up all the time here, but let's zip to the next one. Um, looking at the black and white footage from 1957 in Little Rock, you see Confederate flags, you see um, people trying to push through barricades, the police officers there. Um, and there seems to be, uh, or let me ask you, do you see any echo between what we saw in those images and what you saw firsthand and what happened on January 6th with the storming of the US Capitol? Well, it's quite obvious that it was the same thing. Those same words you use could have been very descriptive of January 6th. Uh, and that's remarkable when you think about it. Um, my wife, as you say, who's an American historian, sometimes complains to me. She says, when I do my research, I go back and, and read the archival newspapers from centuries ago. It's like reading today's newspaper. You could just change the date and the headline. It would be the same thing. At some point, maybe we'll get it. We will understand that uh, we are fighting the same battle. You know, uh, earlier today, I was reading an account of the uh, Israelites who had just been released from Egypt under the leadership of Moses. And they were wandering in the wilderness. You know why they were wandering? Because they wouldn't change. They kept going back to the same old crazy stuff. And that's like us, we're wandering in the wilderness. Uh, at some point, we may get it together. I don't know. As a teacher or a person who's an academic, a member of academia, what are some of the lessons you've taken from Little Rock that you incorporate into your own teaching? Well, <clears throat> I use as a, a format, uh, Little Rock sort of embodies a lot of the issues that we've been facing for centuries. And fortunately, they all come together in Little Rock in a number of ways. We have the fight about federal rights against states' rights, uh, the right to educate all, whether young people should be involved, et cetera, et cetera, goes on. But it's so rich in that way that it becomes sort of a launching pad for discussion on almost any issue that has to do with things racial in this country. One of the biggest things I've learned is we 
the people do what we want. You know, sometimes people say, you legislate change. And that's true. I agree with them. But we can do things if we want to change legislation. I refer us back to prohibition. You see, there was a time in this country's history when the powers that be suggested that we should not have the opportunity or the ability to manufacture, sell, or imbibe alcoholic beverages. And the fervor was so extreme that we passed an amendment to the Constitution. How long did it last? Not long. Oh, no. Americans rose up en masse and said, we will reserve the right to get drunk. You're not taking that away. And they did it. We could do the same with the racist ideology we confront. We could demand that things be changed immediately if we wanted to. We have not. We've not shown that same amount of energy as we showed about alcohol. Figure that one out. I want to go to some of the uh, questions that um, our listeners have, have asked today. Um, one of them first was a thank you for being here. And the question was, uh, a theme of yours is the lifelong struggle to reduce our warehouse of ignorance. So what are you trying to educate yourself about now? I am uh, reading a lot of the works of uh, Walter Brueggemann. Uh, Walter Brueggemann is an Old Testament scholar. And I like him because his approach is so contemporary. And his style of writing is another reason. Prolific writer, uh, Walter Brueggemann has written hundreds of books. But one of the themes that stands out for me is imagination. He contends that in order for us to have effective change, we have to imagine what the change will look like. And as uh, he's led me into more of an examination of poetry. And he wrote a book himself, I think it was 1989, the title of which is uh, Finally Came the Poet. I love that, Finally Came the Poet. And interestingly enough, I read that book just before Amanda Gorman presented her poem at the inauguration. So these things came together almost like serendipity. What happens is once you've heard the scientists, the engineers, the philosophers, the theorists, and they've exhausted everything, finally comes the poet to speak words of sheer truth. See, because in poetry, you're not bound by any of the rules. You can speak truth without fear. And that takes me back to uh, a book called The Prophet by Khalil Gibran, mm -hmm. which I re read every year. Uh, such poetry. Ah, <laughs> there you are. There's my book. So you can't live without the prophet. You cannot live without the prophet. So what he speaks there is such truth. For instance, he talks about crime and punishment in this book. And he says, look, you know, we think there's a difference between us and the criminals. This is my paraphrasing. He said, but we're all responsible. All of us are responsible for each other. And those of us who are smarter and swifter and more fleet of foot have the responsibility of removing the stumbling stones. We have the ability to jump over them, but others coming behind us are too frail to move the stone. Our job is to make sure the path is clear. We don't often get that part. Like Betsy DeVos, she's out chasing yachts. Betsy has at least last count 13 yachts. Uh, I don't know how many she will need in her lifetime, but that's the kind of thing that the prophet speaks about in terms of sharing and helping and being a part of the life of others. Brian Stevenson talks about that too, when he talks about being proximate to people, being where they are, not talking about them, that's one of the reasons I switched my major. Uh, well, at one point in my college career, I was going to major in sociology, but I found out that the sociologists only had an interest in making forays into communities to extract data, and then they would never go back. They would process that data and mine it for publications, for awards, et cetera, but they would not do anything for the community. So that I found my way into psychology. Uh, which isn't a lot better, but at least a, a bit better than the sociologists. 
Yes, I, I love the book, The Prophet. I just happen to have it sitting at my desk because I started rereading it a couple of days ago. Um, another question um, from one of our attorneys, did any of the nine leave during the school year? Um, would the nine meet outside of school for social support? And was there any disagreements between you about how to deal with the extreme opposition you were facing from students, staff and others? No, that's a very interesting question because it assumes I can remember all of that stuff. But I, I will say <clears throat> one of our group was kicked out in February of 58 for fighting, which may seem a bit odd since we'd all taken a vow of nonviolence, but there are limits. So Minnie Jane decided to fight back and well, And I might add in the wake of her expulsion, little cards were printed up and circulated all over that campus, one down, eight to go. And the theory being that since they were able to force her to that point of violence, by increasing the attacks, they would force all of us to do the same thing. They were wrong. We recommitted to principles of nonviolence and toughed it out until the end of the term. Uh, we had uh, disagreements among ourselves at times, not about the fight we were in, uh, about you know staying at Central, but about other stuff, simply because in any group, as I said before, you'll never find unanimity of thought and you might think of us uh, as nine individuals with nine different ways of thinking about most things who are not afraid to speak up. And so once, and it still happens when we're together, no one's shy about saying what they think or believe, uh, no fear about not agreeing with others. So we've had some, you know, confrontations in our own group, which are typical. And I count it, you know, important to have that because if you don't have the ability or the knowledge or the ability or the skill to confront, you're, you're lacking because life is about confronting the issues. You don't have to fight, but you do have to confront. And there's a difference. Confrontation is not combat, folk. You don't have to take up bricks and rocks or like those folk on January 6th, you don't have to try and kill Pelosi because you don't like her ideas. That's not resolving anything. What you have to do is be fairly convinced of the efficacy of your own way of thinking and make a case for it, build a case. And if it makes sense, if it's reasonable, then I will accept it, we'll talk about it. But don't try and force feed me stuff that makes no sense, you know? And I say that particularly to the QAnon folk, who, who if ever there were to be mass incarceration, I might support that. Uh, another question we had was, um, what are your thoughts on someone who displays racism, discrimination, a derogatory phobia toward any group, and then claims I'm not really a racist, or that's not what I truly believe, or that's not what's in my heart? Well, I, I think you don't have to waste a lot of time with that person. You already know who they are uh, based on what they're saying. Uh, anybody who says I'm not racist is already telling a lie because we were all baptized into this cauldron of racism at birth. We can't escape it, it's here. Our task is to work, work our way out of it as a growing, maturing human individual. So that's an easy one. And, and you don't feel you have to fix it either because you can't. There's nothing you can do about it except to model for them a different way of being. That you can do. And that's in fact part of what I see myself doing and being here in Pasadena. I'm modeling for people a different way of doing it. Um, have any of the white students or parents from Central High School who opposed um, your being there reached out to you to express remorse for their opposition? And if so, what, what were those conversations like? People have, honestly. Not a great many of them, but some have. And perhaps uh, the one who stands out in this regard is a young woman named uh, Hazel Bryant. Now, all of you have seen a photo of Hazel because she appears in that iconic photo with Elizabeth Eckford, one of the group of nine. Elizabeth is the, is the one in front and Hazel is the one behind with a mouth open as wide as she can make it yelling out this racist invective. Uh, Hazel has repented. She so completely uh, abhors the fact that she was captured on film during that moment. 
But that's another reason why it's important to always present your best face. <laughs> Somebody might take your picture. At any rate, uh, she has decided, well, she decided as a, as a young adult to give that up. And she explained her case. She grew up in a very racist household. Her parents were extreme racist and they taught the kids to follow that principle of racism. But as an adult herself with her own kids, she had an epiphany one Saturday morning. I think her kids were watching cartoons and she thought, I don't want my kids to have the same experience I had of growing up racist. So she decided, she informed her family and they immediately kicked her out. She's persona non grata at home. That may have changed, but this was some years ago. Uh, but you see, it's, it's like that. If you throw away the family legacy, you might lose the option of hanging out with them during the holidays. I'm not sure if it was entirely clear from the, some of the, the, the video from Marquette University that we watched, that in some cases there were crowds of hundreds of people who surrounded Central High School, some of them calling for you and the other students to be to be brought out and, and lynched. And that that danger was clearly visible in some videos from the outside. But can you talk a little bit about what if any danger there was on the inside? Oh, inside it was worse. Um, outside there was a lot more bluster than, than real action. Not to say that people didn't get injured and hurt. I mean, because there are scenes where, uh, especially some of the black reporters and photographers were beaten unmercifully. But inside, uh, it was no holes barred, you know. Uh, I, on any given day, was not convinced that my name would not show up on a coroner's list by the end of that school day. Uh, and on some days, uh, the efforts to take me out were more successful. I got hit on the head uh, one day so hard, I almost went out. I mean, I almost lost consciousness. But I was able to maintain some balance. I was in the gym, in the locker room. I was able to maintain some balance and stumble across the threshold into the coach's office. And he was able to then come out to see what was happening and they all ran away. We never found out who the assailants really were. But it was that sort of stuff. It was very dangerous, no question about it. And uh, in, in some of the books written by uh, myself and some of my colleagues, you'll see some more of those incidents. I have a follow-up to that that's in um, someone just asked, which was, um, did you feel safe having white officers as escorts? Um, did you have an officer in, in each class? And I would imagine for you know, the women who had male officers, they certainly couldn't go with them everywhere. No, in fact, the, the soldiers assigned to us were restricted. There's a great deal of pressure from the public saying that they were now, as in the words of the governor, in occupied territory. And so they compromised. We could be escorted from room to room, but none of the soldiers could ever enter into the room itself. So uh, in the hallways, we had their uh, attention and, you know, they're watching out for us. But the minute we entered into the room, we were on our own. And it was in the rooms where a lot of stuff happened. And this included the bathrooms, uh, the showers and that sort of thing. Over the past year, there have been multiple examples of historical statues, memorabilia, et cetera, being removed because of their racist symbolism. Some believe we should remove the racist history from our history books in school. Given your earlier comments about the importance of knowing our history, What's your opinion about removing these icons and erasing um, the history from our books? I think that will come as the consequence of everybody understanding and knowing through their own learning about what these things actually symbolize. I think to tear down the statutes without having an opportunity to understand the process by which they were put up uh, makes it uh, a bit difficult because then we just erase and there's a void. I think it would be essential for us to know how it all happened in the first place. And then at some point, yeah, as a natural course of our rewriting the ship, those things would be altered some way. Perhaps some of them would be moved into museums. Uh, we could 
then have classes about this is how it happened and this is the impact of having them up. Uh, you know, uh, seems to me a simple thing, but I think if people put all of their energy into taking down statues, they miss the point. There's a learning that needs to go on before that. The final question um, I have for you is, um, when you see the social unrest in the country from the times when you experienced um, school desegregation and now with some of the present issues that we confront, um, what are three things you believe that we should do to create more unity and lessen the hostility amongst people? Well, I think one thing we can do and perhaps the most immediate thing is to model for those around us what is absolutely possible. And we do this by agreeing to see others in the universe as our peers, not looking up to anybody, not looking down on anybody, but eyeball to eyeball, wherever you are, whatever the situation, letting other people know. Um, I read something this morning, it was a quote from uh, Leo Tolstoy. And he was writing about uh, an experience in his life there in Russia he was walking along and he saw a beggar and he reached his hand in his pocket instinctively to bring out some money to hand to the beggar. And he realized he had no money. And he said to him, brother, I would really like to help you, but I have no money. And the man said to him, don't feel badly. I feel blessed beyond measure because you have called me brother. And I thought that was so important. So that one, modeling for others what's possible. Second thing, I'd like to make these both the first things, uh, and that is to read voraciously. Uh, give up some of that screen time, uh, big screen, small screen, doesn't matter. You don't need it all, but you do need to get your head into something written down and ponder it. Don't just skim over it, sit with it. Let it sink in, question it, talk to others about it. And the third thing is to use the time you have to help younger people come to an appreciation of what you're doing and you can help them do the same thing you're doing, which is another form of modeling really. So all those three things are actually, you could put them on one plane, they don't have to be linear and they interact. But the whole goal is to be different than you are today. In fact, I have a poet friend Who's, who's written down this line, I like it a lot. She says, if what you know hasn't changed you, by all means, change what you know. And you see the impact of that is profound. If you're open to learning, there's so much to be known. I said that was our last question, but one more question snuck in. So if you'll indulge us one more question. Uh, as prosecutors and members of law enforcement, there is a concern, even in the back of our minds, that our professional duties will follow us home and impact our loved ones. Did the violence and hate you experienced at school ever follow you home? Were your parents, relatives, friends, not at Central High School harassed or threatened as a result of your bravery? Oh, absolutely, yes. Uh, whenever you do something, you're not doing it alone in isolation, you represent the family you're a part of, the neighborhood you're a part of. So we had drive-bys. We didn't have that terminology at that time, but we did have drive-bys in the neighborhood. In fact, the, the neighbors who lived across the street had their car trashed four times, four separate times. And I'd already explained to all my neighbors, these are the kinds of things that will happen, so be sure that your car is safe. <laughs> they fail to regard that warning, but uh, that happens. You know, uh, recently I was commissioned by the US State Department to take a trip to Southern Africa and I wound up going to a couple of countries. I went to Swaziland and Malawi. In Swaziland, there's a king. He is one of the few, if not the only remaining king in African countries. But in Malawi, there was a president, duly elected president. But in both cases, there were oppressive governments. My job ostensibly was to talk about community organizing. And that's what I did in daily lectures. But at night, under the cover of darkness, if you will, we had private meetings with young people, particularly about how they could organize and begin to topple the governments and using other means. 
um, had to be very careful. But I explained to them that if you do this, know in advance that some of you may be killed, some of you will be killed, and not just you, but your family members will be singled out. So think seriously about this before you commit. And later on, reading the newspapers, I found out that some of those young people wound up being killed. It's not a very good thing. You know, I was reminded of Bob Moses when he was trying to convince college students to go down to Mississippi to engage in voter registration. And he was at the University of Wisconsin recruiting mostly young white students. And he said to them, I can't force you to go, but I need you to go. I can't make you do this, but I really need somebody to help. And as a consequence, several young white students signed up to go down, but before they went, they all wrote out their last will and testament. They were fully aware of what they were doing and what they were getting into. Is that serious, folk? When you go to war, when you commit to war, you have to know there will be fatalities. Uh, it's not the best thing going, but it's unfortunately who we are. We're not yet divorced from our allegiance to war and warlike behavior. I wish that it were different. Personally, if it were me, I would outlaw war today. We don't need it. I mean, we, we have enough firepower in this country alone to blow up the earth. We could take out the earth on any given day if we wanted to. What does that accomplish? What does war accomplish? Nothing. And yet we seem to be so enamored of killing at that level. We got all backwards, folk. We can do better if we wanted to. I have not sensed any movement in that direction in my entire life. Dr. Roberts, uh, <clears throat> on behalf of the district attorney's office, thank you so much for joining us, for teaching us, uh, for um, describing for us some of the history, firsthand history uh, of this country um, and really your, your warmth, your kindness, your humanity, uh, your intelligence just shines through. And this is really a highlight for us. And, you know, words that are spoken from the heart like yours, uh, God willing, they'll enter our hearts as well. So thank you so much for spending this time with us, Dr. Roberts. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. I'll see you all. Take care.